All right, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here this morning. I'm going to tell you a little bit about work that we're doing in the area of cognitive computing, and we're going to focus on this thing that we call IBM Watson. I don't mean to be selling you IBM Watson, but I do want to give you an opportunity to understand what that is, where it came from, and what we're applying it to. But let me start with trying to explain why we are motivated to go solve this problem that we call cognitive computing. It all comes down to this. It comes down to data. It comes down to an enormous growth in data. Uh, we today are going to generate in our world about 2.5 exabytes of data. That's 2.5 billion billion bytes of data. Um, if you're struggling with that, think about it this way. That's 625 billion Harry Potter books being written every single day. It's a lot of information. And of course, you know, that information is in many different forms. A lot of it is in a form that I refer to as being relevant to the human condition. That is, it's human forms of expression. It's text. It's audio. It's video recordings. Of course, a lot of that's also data coming off of IoT center sensors. But it's an enormous amount of information, so much so that we today, as human beings, cannot keep up with it all. We can't read it all. We can't listen to it all. We can't see it all. We only get to see a very small sliver of all that information that's being produced. And that information is growing at an incredibly rapid rate. We expect that by 2020, we're going to be generating 44 zettabytes of information every single day. And that information disparity, the disparity between the information that's being produced and our ability to consume it, is creating a deficiency in the way that we think the way that we understand, and the way that we make decisions. And it's really this that we believe cognitive computing is going to have the most value. It's this, it's the ability to go in and on our behalf, sift through that information, find the stuff that is most relevant to us, being able to identify those information elements that will change the way that we make decisions, that will inform our decisions, that will inspire our new ideas that would change the way that we as humans think ourselves, that's where we think the cognitive computing is going to have its greatest utility. So let me spend a little bit of time explaining what we mean by cognitive computing. When we talk about cognitive systems, we're looking for four main characteristics. We're looking for systems that learn their behavior. Familiar, if you're familiar with the history of information computing, you know that for the last 68 years, since 1947, when Jonathan Van Neumann and his team at the uh, Center of Advanced Studies began work on what has now become the blueprint for modern computing architecture. They began with the idea that if you could capture a model of the problem that you're trying to solve, then you could use that model, that mathematical model, to answer any questions you might have about that. And so he designed the computer that we now enjoy, the things that are powering our laptops and our smartphones and and our mainframes and all the other places where we apply computing power, all of that is based on the principle that we're executing these mathematical models. Jonathan Van Neumann was a mathematician. Right? He built a computer to solve mathematical problems. And as long as the problem could be resolved, could be identified and explained mathematically, then we've been able to do that. And we've been able to program the symbolic logic of that math in our systems. But that's not the way that a cognitive system needs to work because Frankly, that's not the way that we work. We don't, we don't formulate these mathematical models in our mind that we use to explain everything that we see. Yes, it's great for scientific purposes, it's great for engineering purposes, but the reality is that our human expression, our human condition, is far too complex to represent mathematically, to pick out the subtleties and the nuances of language. Right? The, the little innuendos that we throw in when we express ourselves that convey significance in our, our communication, to convey meaning. Getting down to the underlying intent of our expressions is not about sort of explaining the mathematical model of grammar. Right? We don't go around with this big dictionary in our head looking up each individual word that are, that, are, that are uttered and looking up the definition of those words and piecing together all those definitions to create meaning. We actually drive our understanding through pattern recognition by picking up the features, the linguistic features of our expressions, and through those signals and the patterns of those signals, we learn which of those patterns convey meaning, what kinds of meaning they represent. That's how we work. 
And that's how these cognitive systems have to work. If they're going to read our material and pick up that subtlety, if they're going to understand the intention of what's being uh, expressed in that literature or in that audio or in that video or any other sort of combination of signals that we might otherwise um, be sensitive to, then we've got to operate much of the same way that humans do in terms of understanding. We also focus on human forms of expression. If that isn't obvious already, let me make that very clear. We are focused within these cognitive systems on human forms of expression, or at least on expressions that mimic the way that we as humans communicate with each other. So that could apply to the world of machines that are communicating with each other, not by virtue of a set of encoded, predefined signals, but rather by, by virtue of a variety of signals that may um, represent different conditions and whose patterns could also be interpreted in different ways by their subtlety. The third thing that we do is we focus on, we, we focus on the idea of expertise. And you have to kind of go back to the human world to understand what we mean by this. If you think about what we define as expertise in our world, what defines somebody as being an expert? How do we identify somebody as being an expert? Clearly they know a lot about their subject. Clearly they're able to understand the dynamics and the theory and the underlying principles that represent the foundations of their topic of expertise. We don't necessarily expect experts to be right all the time. We certainly like it when they're right all, most of the time. But we forgive them if they're not. As long as when they do reason about a problem and come up with a proposal, a proposed answer to that problem, that they're able to be transparent about the reasoning. They're able to explain their rationale. They're, being able to, they're able to cite their sources of reference. They're able to map that back to the theories that led to that particular reasoning, right? In other words, we look for a degree of trust and transparency in our experts. We expect them to be able to translate between our lay language and their language of expertise. Doctors, for example, right? When I go to see my doctor, I don't necessarily go in to my doctor explaining my problem in the terminology and the language of medicine I explain it in my lay terms, and I expect my doctor to be able to translate that and make sense of that, to be able to apply that to their area of expertise. That's what we're looking for in experts in each other, and that's the kind of expertise we're looking for in these cognitive systems, because they're dealing with a problem space that is inherently ambiguous, inherently full of subtlety and innuendo, and inherently requires interpretation and judgment. And so we can't expect these systems to be right all the time. What we can expect them to do, however, is be transparent about their rationale. And finally, we expect these systems to evolve, just like we do, just like we do as human beings. If you think about where you were in elementary school and the reasoning strategies that you applied to solving for mathematical problems, the problems of addition and subtraction and multiplication, the reasoning strategies that we developed in third grade to solve these kinds of problems, presumably were good enough for us all to graduate from the third grade. But later in life, when we got exposed to more and more complex mathematical problems, to the problems of trigonometry and algebra and geometry and calculus, those problems required that we evolve our reasoning strategies. The reasoning strategies that we applied for simple mathematical problems were no longer sufficient. We had to learn new techniques. We had to learn new properties. We had to learn new knowledge and apply that when we were thinking about these more complex problems. And so in the same way, we expect these cognitive systems to evolve as well. But I want to make a point, because there's a lot of popular press out there today that would suggest that these cognitive systems are about to sort of replace the human mind. And, you know, maybe, someday, sort of maybe at the same time that we learn how to terraform Mars, right, cognitive systems will develop the sophistication, this equivalent of our human mind, but that's not what we are interested in. That's not what's ma what matters. What we're interested in is how do we use cognitive systems to amplify human cognition? Just like we would with any other kind of tool that, that society has ever created, it's largely about amplifying our own personal and social strengths. And that's what cognitive systems are doing as well. They're trying to activate the psychology of human, human cognition. How do we make it possible for human beings to think about a problem in a way that they might not have thought about before? How do we lead people to come up with ideas that they might not have had on their own? How do we enable people to make decisions based on information that 
was otherwise obscured by the mass volume of information that's out there. That's what we're focusing on. So we like to say that these cognitive systems don't do your thinking for you. They do you, their research for you so that you can do your thinking better. And that's really the key that we're focusing on in the cognitive computing space for Watson. And that doesn't mean that we don't end, end up spending some time trying to understand how the human mind works. We get a lot of inspiration from human beings. We look at and what, we model and we, we observe human behavior out of which we can derive some basic understanding of how humans think and how people reason because that inspires us on the algorithms and the approaches that we take to support that human reasoning process to amplify that human cognitive process. So we do get a lot of inspiration from that. So we took this idea and we pursued it in the game of Jeopardy. Anybody get a chance to hear about that or see about that? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, we, we, put Watson, we put Watson in competition against other human beings, the best of the best at playing the game of, of Jeopardy. And, we did that not just because it was an interesting publicity stunt, but rather because Jeopardy actually represents a very interesting example of the challenge that humans have when it comes to dealing with the human condition. That is, if you think about the, the questions that are asked on the game of Jeopardy, they're in, in, inherently, they're actually not ambiguous, it turns out. They're, they're actually written to be relatively precise with respect to the answers that they're expecting. Otherwise, it would be difficult to judge whether somebody actually came up with the right answer or not. But they are deliberately written to mislead people, to misguide them, misdirect them. They're full of puns and in window, right? And they do that specifically to kind of trip up the human mind. So the trick here was not only to be able to interpret the question in the context in which it was intended, to understand the context and use that context to kind of fill in the gaps of understanding, but also to use that to go in and look for information. And in this case, we had to read about 200 million pages of literature to find what we would consider to be an appropriate answer for the question being asked. And we couldn't do that in advance. We couldn't sort of go out and take these 200 million pages of literature and just compute all the entire space of possible answers because frankly, we didn't know what the questions were going to be in advance. We didn't know any more than anybody else did. Right? The topics change from week to week on the game of Jeopardy. Nobody really knows in advance what this question is going to be. You have to figure it out at the time. And you have to figure it out in the context in which those questions are being asked. And so trying to pre-compute all that would have been a waste of time and space and probably would have been virtually impossible anyway. So in the moment, at the time the question was, was offered to the contestants, Watson also had to take that question, figure out what it meant, find candidate answers, rank order those candidate answers based on its interpretation of the various different signals that would suggest meaning in those answers, and do all that within three seconds, because that's the average time that human contestants have to respond with. Now, we did that with a very large machine. All right, it was uh, 1,980 cores of compute power, 15 terabytes of memory space, another 20 terabytes of disk space, in a single user machine, right? Alice Trebek was the only user of that machine. Um, he asked one question at a time. So it was a little bit over provision, but nonetheless, we did okay um, at the game, right? But the real breakthrough was demonstrating that we could tackle this problem of human reasoning to be able to understand the human condition, the human expression well enough to be able to solve real problems. And in fact, the real problem that we got exposed to immediately after airing the game of Jeopardy was in the medical space. Doctors called us up. That night, we got phone calls from doctors saying, I've got a problem, and I think you could help us. And the problem is that I don't have enough time to read all the literature that's coming out in my area of, of expertise. Right? Doctors have, on average, about five hours a month to spend reading the very latest literature that's in this germane to their discipline. Now, on the other hand, we estimate that for a doctor to read all the material that's coming out in their area of discipline every week, would take them about 160 hours of reading time a week. There's only 168 hours in the week, so it doesn't leave a whole lot of time to practice your medicine, let alone, let alone all the other things you might want to do in life. So it, this is a perfect example of this disparity that's now occurring between the rate of progress in a given science, an area of science, or area of interest, or area of concern, right? And our ability to keep up with that literature, with that material, with that set of information. 
So we went to work on solving the problem of reading medical literature. And of course, as you can imagine, you know, the language of medicine is substantially different than the language of Wikipedia. And so we had to adapt Watson to recognize this additional linguistic characteristics that we see within the area of medicine. And we applied it to the problem of helping doctors identify appropriate treatments for their oncology patients. To be able to read through not only the literature and find the very latest treatments and the latest, very latest research that was relevant to their cancer patient, but to be able to do that, we had to start by reading the patient's medical record. To read through the history of clinical notes that the doctor has taken and the nurses have taken and the technicians have taken about this patient, and from that, identify the pertinent clinical information and then apply that to do patient similarity analytics, to be able to find the microsegmentation of other cohorts, other patients that are just like this one, not based on age and race and sex, but based on you know, the 4,000, 5,000, 10,000 variables that kind of define who we are, right? Including our medical condition, our current disease state, but also including our family history, our genetics, our environmental exposure, our pharmacological exposure, our medical history our, 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 of disease. All those things that kind of condition who we are at the moment. And therefore, for based on how other people who are like us, use that as a predictor of how we're going to respond to a given treatment, not only just in terms of how well that treatment is going to cure our disease, but in the area of cancer, of course, the big concern is what kinds of side effects are you going to, are you going to experience? Because you, know, you guys have seen the commercials, right, where you see somebody advertising some new miracle drug and then you spend half the commercial listening to all the potential side effects that scare, uh, scare you away from wanting to even take that medicine. Well, all those side effects represent individuals who reacted differently to that drug. Usually just a very small percentage of individuals, but the potential is there based on who you are. And all of that is a function of all these other conditions that I've listed. And so trying to get that microsegmentation is important. But then also trying to understand the standard of care practices, understand the clinical expertise. What do the best of the best doctors do in a circumstance like that? How do they think about it? Can we go back to the MSK, the Memorial Sloan Kettering doctors who see 100,000 patients a year, not individually, but collectively, right? And out of which they develop a tremendous sense, an intuition almost, of how to think about this patient, what to look for, what they recognize, and how to think about further diagnosing that patient to come to a treatment, capture that. If we can capture that from those 10 or 20 or 50 doctors who are considered to be the best of the best in the country, and now materialize that in the cognitive system and deploy that for every other doctor in the country to leverage, you've essentially democratized that expertise. You've now activated for the average person the cognitive processes allow them to elevate their own capabilities to a higher level, to be able to, to practice their medicine better because they have the benefit of not only access to information that's relevant to them at the time they're making this decision, but also based on the expertise that other people have provided and captured in the cognitive system. We've now applied this in a number of different areas, and I'm not going to go through all the different applications of this, but I will say that we have kind of correlated this down to a set of patterns. There are a set of usage patterns and they kind of line up along these five axes, right? There's the area of exploration. This is you know, the knowledge worker who needs to just simply have situational awareness, what we call a 360 view of their particular area of concern, right? All the data that's relevant to their job, not necessarily to make a decision, although oftentimes that's what we end up doing with it, not, necessarily even, necess not even necessarily to go drive insights, but just simply to create awareness, right? If I'm a chief mar marketing officer, I need to know, you know what campaigns are in, in the field, which campaigns are in development, how well are people responding to the campaigns, what products are coming along that I need to create new campaigns for, what is happening in the social media, what are the trends and in, in expectations that my target market has. I need to know all this information, and it's coming from many different sources, and when it comes to me at my desktop, the first issue I'm going to face is the fact that it's overwhelming. And so what we need the cognitive system to be able to do is kind of filter that to, to prioritize that information, to render that information in a way that's meaningful to me, to interpret that in a way that I can make use of it. 
The second pattern is what we call the pattern of engagement. And this is often depicted by an interaction between a client, a consumer, and an institution. You can think of it as being most often represented by the things that customers do when they call your call center or go to your web pages for information. If you think about the situation today, it's actually quite dissatisfying. Nobody likes getting on the 1-800 number and being put on, call, on hold. Nobody likes getting to a call center rep and finding out that that person really doesn't know the information that I'm looking for and now having to be passed off to somebody else, which means I'm probably then on hold again and being bounced around between people that eventually may or may not be able to answer my question. I don't like going to a website and have to read through all the material just to get to a simple answer for a question I might have. And I certainly don't like the idea of my customers going to blog sites where everybody and their mother has an opinion about my products, most of which is misinformed, many of which is misdirecting, and some of which is derogatory, right? And so all of those experiences are pretty dissatisfying. But if, on the other hand, we can create a situation where a customer in that same situation can simply go to a virtual assistant and ask questions and get answers because Watson has gone in, the cognitive system has gone in, and read the literature and found the answers and be able to provide that and understand the context of the question and be able to understand the conversation because nobody really kind of asks just one question, right? Some people ask many different questions or kind of leading up to a thought. And so there needs to be a conversation, there needs to be an interaction, you need to be able to engage with that client, you need to be able to answer not only the questions about your products, but also about the circumstances in which they might be thinking about their product. If you're a bank and you're selling mortgages, and if somebody gets up and gets on your website looking for a mortgage, it's probably not because they woke up this morning and said, oh, you know, all my friends have mortgages, I want one too. There's probably something going on in their life that led them to need a mortgage. And if you're a bank and you can only answer questions about mortgages, you're probably not engaging them on all the other things that they care about. If they are buying a mortgage, they're probably buying a house. They may be moving. They may be changing jobs. They may be interested in what the resale value of that house is in that neighborhood. They may be interested in knowing what the quality of education is in that neighborhood. They may be interested in knowing what the lifestyle offerings are in that neighborhood. They may have all these other questions. If you can't answer those questions at the bank, guess what? That consumer, that customer is going to go off to somewhere else to get answers to those questions. They're going to go to a different website. They're going to go to different searches, each of which offers the opportunity for somebody else, your competitor, to get in there with an ad banner and distract that customer. So you want to retain the focus and the attention of that customer as long as possible. You want to engage them. You want to be able to deliver all the information they care about, even when it's about things that you don't necessarily offer. Right? Understanding them in their context allows you to engage them a lot more. The third pattern is what we call the pattern of discovery. And this is where researchers or analysts, advisors, who have a professional responsibility to come up with new ideas or to be able to see, as I say it, not just the answer to the question, but to be able to recognize the questions that I'm not thinking to ask. I mean, that's what a, a, an analyst is really responsible for, isn't it? It's about thinking about the things that nobody else has discovered or nobody else thought to think about or nobody else thought to ask about. It's in those areas that the greatest risk and opportunity lies in your institution. Right? It's the thing that you're not thinking about, that your competition is, that they're leveraging against you as an opportunity to compete with you. It's the things that you are thinking of that your competition is not or that nobody else has that gives you the opportunity to come out with a new product or a new offering or to change your business model. That's what discovery is about. The fourth one is, uh, I think it's mislabeled, mislabeled here, it's about evaluating policies or evaluating human expressions of condition. So you can think of these as policy statements. You can think of them as, as compliance statements. You can think of them in all those cases you know, the example that we have is in, again, the healthcare space, clinical trials. There's 195,000 clinical trials currently active, registered at ctm.gov, or clinicaltrials.gov, right? Every one of those has a set of inclusion and exclusion rules, a set of statements that were provided by the trial author that identifies whether a patient is eligible to be using this trial. Right? A whole series of statements. Every condition is written in human form, in a form that is intended to be interpreted by hu other human beings, namely doctors, and determine and evaluate and judge whether or not this patient is eligible for this clinical trial. 
right? Doctors rarely have the time to go read through 195,000 clinical trials, reading each one of those clinical trial conditions, the inclusion and exclusion criteria, to determine whether their patient is eligible. So oftentimes we don't end up leveraging the very latest advances in medicine because we don't have time to go find the ones that are relevant to this patient. So if Watson, the cognitive system, can go out and read those conditions and evaluate that, at least do a first order pass through that, because by the way, there is ambiguity and therefore it does still require that a doctor pass final judgment on this, but nonetheless get it down from 195,000 to let's say five or 10, now it's reasonable. Now you can expect the doctor to actually be able to spend the time to figure out whether their, doc their patient should be signed up for this clinical trial or not. And the last one is decision. I'm sorry, I got this too backwards. Decision, which is really, again, the case that we described in the case of Memorial Sloan Kettering, helping doctors identify which treatments are most relevant to their patient based on a whole series of criteria. Again, pattern matching for the signals that are most relevant for determining whether this, tre this treatment is something they should consider. So we've gone through a whole evolution within Watson. We started with the fact of a pipeline. We created a passive pipeline. We have now moved on to creating a set of cognitive services. And I want to talk about these services very briefly because this has created an ecosystem and allowed us to, to sort of democratize the availability to open up the platform for other people to come in and build their own applications using these cognitive services. Today we have about 30 services that we make available as APIs on Bluemix. And anybody can come along and build an application that uses these services. In particular, we focused on an ecosystem, a set of business partners who have signed up to make use of these services for building business applications. We have about 530 business partners that are, that are currently uh, in contract building applications. About 150 of those applications are in market today. And they range an enormous spectrum of capabilities, range, you know, including things like we've got one company who's building an application for, um, for trainers for sports trainers, people who are in the business of training their clients to run better or to lose weight or to get in shape or all those kinds of things. We've got one that's building a toy called Cognitoys, right? It's a little toy dinosaur that's intended to interact with children, to tell them riddles and stories and answer questions, but also to help develop and educate these children. Um, and one in particular, Spark Cognition um, is one of our partners, you may be familiar with them, have built an application working with a leading aerospace manufacturer uh, developing aerospace engines um, that's focused on helping that manufacturer resolve maintenance problems faster. Be putting an application in the hands of the maintenance technicians and the maintenance directors that allows them to very quickly identify not just the problem, but more specifically, the answer to that problem and how to go resolve that quickly. Getting them to the material in all the maintenance procedures that is most relevant to that particular problem based on the context of the problem, based on natural language, based on being able to explain the problem in human words, and from that being able to identify what are the, most, uh, what are the, uh, uh, the maintenance procedures that are most significant and appropriate for that particular problem. So I'm going to end this with a very quick segue into another dimension that we're now exploring, and that is the dimension of, a th of what we call anthropomorphic animation. That is the ability to interact between humans and machines, not based just on typing in text or even just simply speaking your commands and questions, but really kind of facilitating what is natural for you and I, which is our ability to communicate through a variety of of channels. That is, we communicate with our words. As you listen to me right now, you're listening to my words, but it's not just my words. You're also listening to my intonation and my cadence, my inflection, the things that I vocalize to help put punctuation on my intention, to be able to sort of isolate and emphasize those words that I want you to hear the most, that are most significant to the meaning that I'm trying to convey. But it's also my body language. It's my hand gestures, it's my facial expression, it's my eye movement. My body, my torso movement, all those things are relevant to amplifying my meaning. And so what you're going to see here is a video of a piece of work that we're doing in the lab with a, what we call a social robot. And what I want you to notice as you see this movie is the body language, right? The hand gestures, the eye movement, and how that amplifies or emphasizes our understanding and how it changes that human-machine interaction. 
please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Noya. I am one of six robots working with the IBM Watson team. Feel free to ask me anything. Also, what do you think of my blue robotic body? Isn't it pretty? It's very pretty. Is that your favorite color? I really like the color magenta. My eyes turn magenta when I am thinking of an answer to a question. What's yours? My favorite color is blue. That's a nice color, but magenta is better. Would you like to ask anything else? Do you have any talents? I consider myself to be quite musically talented. Can you sing us a song? Have you heard the new one by Taylor Swift? Cause the player's gonna play, 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 and the heat is gonna hee, 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 hee. Baby, I'm just gonna shake, 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 shake. Shake it up, shake it up. I thought you said you were a good dancer. Wait, just take a look at this. Open Gangnam Style. So uh, we put the dance music in there only because it is the it is representative of sort of the the most obvious way in which human beings use their body to express themselves, and really just to help again to emphasize that we think that there's something powerful about these kinds of social robots in the machine human interface that allows us to bring out the richness and the facility of these cognitive systems in workplaces, in the lobbies, and hospitals, in your home, in ways that we don't experience today, and really kind of transform the way that we think about the role of computing and change it from being a computer science problem to a problem of sociology and psychology, to integrate it into the fabric of our lives. So I'm going to close here real quick by saying, look, this cognitive system, this idea of applying cognition within the, within the computing system for the purposes of amplifying our own human cognition, this isn't a novelty. This is not a, an experiment. This is coming. This is going to change how we apply computing to our world and to our lives. This is going to be the dominant form of computing in the next 10 years, and principally because of the very first thing that I said. It's about the data. It's about the growth of the data. We cannot possibly live in the world that we live in today and survive and do well if we aren't able to tap into that massive volume of information and make sense of it. And if that information is in a form that today requires sort of a human interpretation, then we're going to need cognitive systems to help us make that interpretation so we have the best information available to us to work with. Thank you. Great. So I mean, Watson not only can solve problems, but also can dance and sing. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Great. But by the way, uh, yeah. uh, there is a report on machine learning uh, that uh, ARC uh, wrote a couple of months ago. It is in your app. So you can actually. Uh, when you have a chance, uh, feel free to read that report as well. Um, so what uh, we are going to do to start with uh, here is uh, uh, I'm going to ask uh, our uh, new panelists here, each one of them, to uh, introduce themselves uh, briefly and then start by talking about one technology that you are exploring or excited about to uh, use in your personal life or in the plant uh, in the near future. Maybe, how about, could we start with you, Stuart? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, first, I'm Stuart Madnick uh, from the Information Technology Group at the MIT Sloan School of Management. I'd like to start off with yeah, Stuart, uh, Stuart, Stuart, a question. Stuart, Stuart, Stuart. Is that better now? Yeah, yeah thank you. I appreciate that. I won't repeat. I'm Stuart Madnick from MIT. But I have a quick question for the group here. Uh, I don't know how many of you go back in history enough, but how many of you here remember a company called Digital Equipment Corporation? Anybody? 
You may remember it was the second largest company after IBM at one time. But the thing I want to point out, there's a famous expression, what is it that it's uh, difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. So Ken Olson was the founder and, and president of a digital corporate corporation. And he's very famous for a quote he said, this is probably in the maybe late 1970s when the Apple II was coming out and the early IBM PC was coming out. And he said that I can see no practical use for a computer in the home. <laughs> there was a pause and maybe it could be used for keeping kitchen recipes. <laughs> Question, how many of you have at least one computer in your home? <laughs> how many of you keep kitchen recipes on it? <laughs> I don't know that. The reason I'm saying that, of course, is all, it, being able to predict how things are going to play out is extremely difficult. And you have many other examples in your life. So with that kind of as a caution, let me try to address Andy's question. I think the thing that I find fascinating, and very consistent, but it's a different twist on the, on the introduction of the IBM Watson, is this whole Internet of Things thing, if you will. The idea that there will be literally billions upon billions of devices around. Uh, uh, my own particular research area, by the way, is cybersecurity. I'll be glad to talk more about that later on in the questions. But the example I use is that now moving into the kitchen. I think LG has a, a internet connected refrigerator. An example I use is my brother is one of those folks when he wakes up in the morning cannot function until ha he's had his cup of coffee. Say so imagine a day when you get an email message that says we have hijacked your computerized coffee pot. <laughs> and unless you deposit $500 account you will not get your morning coffee. So those are the kind of things in terms of new technologies and the challenges that new technologies have. Thank you very much. So my name is Mike Dudzik. Uh, uh, I'm general manager of process automation at Arsa Middle DeFasco in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. We're the largest steel company in the world there. Uh, in terms of uh, technology, the area that we're very excited about and really exploring these days is the big data in advanced predictive analytics. So an area that we're focusing in on is less on the size of the data, but more on maximizing the value of all the data that we have. And here's an example that maybe one of you end users might uh, think about uh, when you're looking at your uh, plant, is that you have uh, a lot of process data, your operations uh, is looking at trying to understand different uh, abnormal operations. Your operators in the control rooms have different cameras and different viewpoints on looking at the process and that. But most of your models, most of the analytics that you do today are based on process data, structured data. The, what we're seeing in the big data space here is that marrying of structured and unstructured data. So areas that we're exploring, areas that you might want to investigate might be, could you marry some of your video data, uh, those cameras that are in your pulpits or your control rooms, and marry that with process data to give you signatures of different abnormal operations, giving you insights into what uh, might be a problem for you there versus just the process data there. Um, yeah, good morning. I'm Paul Comuti. I look after uh, technology and strategy for Ingersoll Rand. Um, we're a diversified industrial company making everything from uh, commercial air conditioners all the way through to electric vehicles with club car. Um, we have a lot of technology opportunities in the company, and the one uh, that I'm sort of most excited about right now is around this uh, uh, topic of data analytics. Um, we, but, uh, you know, the, the spin that I would put on it is we, you know, we're working on a lot of different uh, sets of technology from cognitive computing to machine learning to some, some you know, basic uh, data analytics in order to empower our employees to do a better job for our customers. Right, so um, you know, I know we focus on manufacturing, but if you think about it, one of our our businesses, um, we make trailer refrigeration units, and it's sort of really important. The quality of those products are important, and how do we take that structured and unstructured data in order to get advanced warning signs? Because a lot of times, our customers or our field uh, service people take problems away from our customers that we should. Uh, be solving back in our, our manufacturing operations. And so gathering all that data, um, really uh, using learning and cognitive computing in order to be able to get ahead of that, uh, to give our customers a better experience with regard to quality is just one example. And so 
you know, there's, there's many other technology examples, but I do think that there is something around this analytics space that's really important. I'm Carol Eid, I'm with ExxonMobil, and um, what I wanted to talk about was actually a little bit different from what these gentlemen have, because we're doing all of those things, and I'm excited about all those things. But, but one area that hasn't really come up yet is, um, and I think it's really a challenge not only for us, but, but um, for the whole industries, um, is in, is in, in learning, um, experiential learning, and how do we harness the data um, that we've captured and the knowledge we have in our, in our experts to bring on the next generation. Um, one of the things we're, we're considering exploring is, is better use of our, of our operator training simulators to develop the expertise in our engineers. And um, this cognitive learning process that we just heard about is really, really um, interesting from a, the aspect of how could we harness that to, to grow capability. Um, so those are the, that's the thing I'm most excited about at this point, in, in addition to the, to the data analytics that we've been talking about and um, um, operator capability um, that you guys just mentioned. Excellent. Um, before we uh, go here, let me ask you, please raise your hand uh, in the audience if you have questions. Uh, could I ask ARC folks to please uh, uh, come, come around with the uh, mics uh, in, in the room? Uh, uh, could we have some mics? And uh, there is a question here. Uh, okay, there. So, uh, so please get your uh, questions ready, and we will bring Mike to you. In the meantime, I like to ask a question from the panelists here. You know, obviously, as we are talking about all these new technologies, uh, 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 I think we have to prepare ourselves and our people to really be ready to deploy and use these technologies. And I like to actually maybe uh, uh, start with asking uh, Rob at the end here, maybe what do you think uh, companies need to do to get their uh, people ready for using cognitive computing or other technologies in the organizations? Yeah, good, thanks, Andy. There's, uh, there's two sides to that. One is getting ready to make use of of cognitive systems in the jobs that we have to get done, and and you know how we how we apply that in our everyday workflows and activities. The other side of that, of course, is is teaching these cognitive systems around the areas of expertise that we have or that we need for them to have in order for them to facilitate that. Um, so, in the first case, you know, there's a tradition, and uh, and Paul, I think maybe you touch on this that you know, we are kind of focused on quantitative data as the way that we think about the utility of computing to solving problems in our space. Sometimes we may use the, the computing capabilities to also deal with workflow problems, but mostly we're dealing with quantitative data and learning that there is something of utility in the unstructured space as well. And learning how to blend that is, is it actually takes a mind shift. You have to kind of think about the utility of these non-mathematically modeled ways of reasoning as having utility and, and something that we can exploit. And that there's a mind shift that has to do with that. There, you know, I still would deal with people in the financial services area that do a lot of um, you know, trying to figure out what investments are most appropriate for their clients. And they just they they are fixed on it has to be mathematically modeled. It has to be based on quantitative data. They actually refer to themselves as quants. Uh, and realize that there's something in the subjective space that we're all conditioned to that actually influences markets, influences investment quality just as much as the quantitative information does that is just as important. So that's, that's a conditioning that I think we have to kind of uh, bring our workforces through. On the other side, of course, is teaching these cognitive systems the information. And there, that requires actually spending a lot of time not just on the practice of, of education, of teaching, but actually looking at your data and curating it. We have a lot of bad data out there, a lot of material that's been written that is either not of the form that we want it to be in, is not of the information currency that we need it to be, is not complete, uh, huge gaps in our literature uh, around products in particular that need to be filled in before the cognitive systems can be really be beneficial. 
Carol, do you, would you like to add something to that? What, what is Exxon doing to prepare your folks? So um, for Exxon Mobil, um, one of the things we're really focusing in on is our culture, which gets into what you were saying a bit, is, is um, a real emphasis in, in our manufacturing and our, our research and engineering organization and even across the corporation on, on our behaviors and cultures. The technology, we have you know, very good processes for development of technology enabling and it's a core value for us and part of our strategy uh, for success. Um, but where the really untapped potential is continuing to, to grow our capability of our, our resources and the culture and, and how we do that. We were having a conversation, in fact, with the pan some of the panel members ahead of this and said, hey, the technology is easy compared to the people. Uh, and it goes into just some of the things you were saying about cognit cognitive um, learning and, and changing mindsets. So the same thing is on that. And, and when we talked about innovation yesterday. So, so how do you anticipate, innovate, and, and empower your people on a daily basis, no matter what their role is, to, to prepare them to really embrace the technology that we're trying to drive. Excellent. Paul, do you have a comment? Yeah, I mean, Andy, I think it's a great question. So a um, couple things. One is we're, you know, we come into this not clean and, and, and new, right? We've been talking about expert systems, I think, in, in industry for decades, right? And this was, really, I think, positioned pretty incorrectly from the technology community as, you know, a set of rules that we could codify that would replace a, a person. And, and, you know, that's why kind of when starting off for me, I think the perspective is that, you know, first we have to uh, look at this as an opportunity to empower our employees, right, to get the data uh, and analytics and information and to encourage everybody to make fact-based uh, decisions is a word that we use a lot in our company. And so, you know, I think, you know, setting the expectation that we're really uh, trying to have the business overall perform at a different level and the way that we're going to do that is to get our, our employees and associates really using, um, you know, the best uh, tools and set of data and facts that we can um, is, is really a starting point. The other thing is um, we've been kicking around a concept, um, you know, I don't know if it's been coined an acronym if I picked it up along the way of, you know, have we have bring your own devices is really to think about bring your own analytics. Um, there's a lot of really uh, great tools today that can you can put on an engineer's desktop or you can put on, you know, a financial a financial analyst desktop to do analytics. But really, they struggle with the data um, and to to really understand how to use that data. And so, a lot of the work that we're doing in order to be able to empower our employees is to give them sort of free reign to do analytics that will help them to innovate and solve problems that they're having. Uh, where the center-led teams are really focusing on making the data, uh, both the structured and unstructured data, available. Um, and actually, the, the, the stuff that we were just talking about, uh, Rob brought up of, you know, analytics as a service or cognitive systems as a service, really lend themselves to, to empowering our people to be the, you know, the best that they can be in driving the analytics, because they'll think up, you know, uh, things to go do that we couldn't ever envision from the, from the center. You'd like to add anything? Uh, the only thing I'll add, because all this was excellent uh, input there, is that one of the things that we always have to be cognizant of in uh, the end user community is that uh, there has to be a very strong, in my area, the manufacturing like strategy transformation that we have going forward, a business strategy transformation going forward. And then it's that whole side in the technology and the people side are the enablers to make these things happen there. So all the things that we do, we have to really understand the business drivers, the business needs, the, the manufacturing drivers and needs, and then look at technology, look at people and all the tools and techniques that we need to do to enable meeting those drivers in that, because that's what will get us moving forward. Uh, I would like to maybe broaden the issue a bit. Uh, although MIT is a university, we have always had a long concern about the overall educational process through all ages. And if you're thinking about it, uh, just in the, I guess, Obama's budget announced yesterday, uh, the old uh, three R's of reading, writing, arithmetic have become the three R's in C, and that is every school child is going to learn how to code. And although I think maybe there's an interesting thought there, I think there, there is a correct idea maybe buried in there, and that is a more pragmatic, a more analytical way of thinking 
that's not just a matter of the employees in our companies, but the customers and the society at large. And I think we're at a cusp now. How many of you have had a member of the family or a neighbor say, could you help me connect my Wi-Fi? Or could you explain to me how to set the timer on my VCR? They don't VCRs anymore. I mean, uh, we're, we're, there is a certain type of thinking process that I think is now is clear that we need to incorporate that not just amongst our, our level, but throughout society. And I think that is going to be the next big change. My fears are it's going to stumble a lot before they get it right. But I think that's where things have to go. Um, let's move to questions from the floor. Uh, we have a question here. Please, please identify yourself briefly uh, before you ask your question. Yeah, uh, I'm Abraham from um, LNT. Uh, the question is for uh, Rob. Uh, are there any limitations on the IBM Watson where it can work or where it cannot work? For example, let's say the automated control of a refinery or uh, investment decision in real estate, stock market. Can we set like I want to make a target of one million in two years or something? Will it work like that? So it doesn't really quite work like that. Um, the services are are first exposed to a set of corpora, corpus, set of data, set of content that serves as this basis of knowledge. Uh, and this is done individually for each uh, institution that we set the service up for. And then it is trained in that area. So it's trained to understand the, 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 the patterns of meaning in that context. And because we do that for each individual institution that we offer the service to, um, it is entirely up to them to decide what information they want to provide as a knowledge base, what kind of training they want to perform to get it to become expert in that space and how to implement that within the context of whatever application of technology or, or workflow they're trying to, to leverage, exploit. Um, and so the decision as to whether it's appropriate or not appropriate becomes um, one of the institution. And you'll find this over and over again, a theme that we really would try to emphasize. We're not trying to take decisions away from people. Uh, we don't believe we can make decisions for people. What we can do with these cognitive systems is bring the information to them that they need to be able to make a better decision. And so we don't, we don't, we don't aspire to take over those roles. We don't try to position the technology for that. And we certainly don't develop the technology with the idea that it will. We really try to build the technology with the idea that it's going to be incorporated into a process where human beings, at the end of the day, are making final decisions. Could we go to question right here? Yes, sir. And this is on? Everyone hear yeah, me? Just start speaking. It will okay. come up. OK. Um, I was particularly interested by Carol's input. And uh, this is really both for Carol and Rob. Um, when you uh, look at uh, integrating into an organization or organizational learning for the next generation and training people, there are things that are in manuals, right? Like, OK, here's how a product works. Here's how a particularly factory line works. That's very easy to capture. But what about the tribal knowledge? What about the emotional piece um, that is involved in very important things, like the acquisition of a company or the integration of a company into a larger one? And you, you know, it's very hard to digitize, if you will, the political uh, interactions that you might have amongst organizations and teach that to the next generation of employees. And I'm, I'm just curious about how that all gets in. And, and by the way, I want to link it back to, to Jeopardy. Uh, I'm, I'm not a huge Jeopardy fan, but I noticed you had 100 million pages of information. So some human being, right, said, OK, here's the appropriate 100 million pages of information. So it was only as smart as somebody who you know, took that 100 million. And I bet you there wasn't a lot of emotional intelligence in that. And so that goes back to Carol's point. That's my question. So. Well, let me start. I mean, so, so one of the things we've been exploring is, is, yes, you know, there's the procedures and the processes all well documented. But it's the how do I make choices and decisions? Um, how do that experiential knowledge is what, what do we call it? 
and, and the stuff that I've learned over my 25, 30 years, and how do I embark that instead of just, uh, you know, and, and I would say engineers are not good teachers, right? And, and so they, they basically say, follow me and watch me and do what I do. So how do you, how do you transform that experiential knowledge? We talked about um, from a reliability standpoint, everybody wants their equipment to be online. Well, when we learn is when it's broken. So the longer it's online, you, don't, you have less opportunity to, to grow, the, grow that knowledge of the decision making. So there's, it's pretty fascinating stuff, but there, there are experts out there on, on how, how to teach that. Um, if you think about the military, for example, situational awareness, right, really important. How does a general transition the knowledge he's learned to the, to the follow-up? So, so there's some deliberate work processes that you can do, and we're doing some of that, but that's kind of tactical. The more is, is how, do you, how do you grow it from the day somebody walks in the door? Um, so that's what we're trying to focus on, and we have, we have a few activities in that direction. Anybody else like to come? Uh, well, I guess a related issue that maybe is hitting into is in most organizations there's what I'll call the documented knowledge, the documented procedures. And then there's what people actually do. Right. And one of the concerns, of course, is that if you only fed into, say, Watson, what it is you think the organization is doing, mm -hmm. and you don't have access to what the organization actually is doing, then you're missing something. This is one of the big challenges, whether it be with a Watson or just with anybody joining your organization. Uh, a lot of times what makes the organization really run are things that often are not documented. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Let's go to question here. Please uh, identify yourself briefly. Uh, Bill, I'll, I'll get back to you afterwards uh, okay. and we can oh, okay. discuss Sorry. the rest Sorry. of the question later. Uh, right. Bill Lydon, International Society of Automation and Automation.com. Um, maybe it's a simple-minded question. You know, we live and die on sensor data out of the, you know, in the manufacturing arena. And the term structured and unstructured data, right? Can you, I'm thinking Rob High maybe to start, can you give a simple definition about structured and unstructured data, and then considering that we deal with sensors and these end devices, where is the best place to add context to that data in our system architectures? So um, we've fallen into the habit of referring to the world in terms of structured versus unstructured, but in fact, that's kind of unsatisfying. Uh, for me, it comes down to um, quantitative data and qualitative data. Um, quantitative being something that we can put, well, numeric value on, but more importantly, we can define the semantics based on the actual syntax that we associate with that data. So numeric data is simple because the semantics are inherent in its syntax. Structured data is generally in that same category primarily because the syntax is buried in the structure. Um, but qualitative data is the world of the human condition. And that's probably too limiting, too, because while I talk about text and audio and, speak and vision, the reality, as you point out, anything that can be sensed whose sensory value is not necessarily intrinsically um, semanticful, that is, you can't derive the semantics directly from its own value or the way that it was presented, but rather requires that you interpret and evaluate and whose, who's, you know, human value is our ability to judge that interpretation of being meaningful or not meaningful, those are the areas of the unstructured space that I find interesting. Um, so um, it is, as has already been pointed out a couple of times now, I think important that we evaluate both. And the flaw I think that we have in most applications of information technology today is to limit its use only to that structured space, the, the um, the quantitative space. Um, we're used to that. We like to justify ourselves on the basis that we want to make decisions based on facts. I think that point was made earlier as well. In reality, that's not what we do as human beings, right? We, we actually blend a combination of facts, intuition, uh, inspiration, a whole lot of things that are not as well founded in the nouns and verbs or the entities and relationships that we might also otherwise associate with facts. And uh, I think when we realize that, when we realize in ourselves, realize that in our decision processes, when we realize that in our decisions about how we judge things and interpret things, now we can begin to see the utility of the cognitive space focusing on the unstructured information as well. 
Um, any other question over there? Yes, I, I have a question. It's uh, concerning. Could you please identify yourself and stand up? Oh, sorry. Uh, my <laughs> yeah, name is Tuko Fenerol. I'm, I'm managing an organization called PLC <laughs> Open, and I got a question for Rob. Uh, thanks for this excellent presentation. But I'm a little bit confused with the numbers. I see the data growing that rap, 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 rapidly. I see that for Jeopardy, you used an, a tremendous amount of, of com computing power that doesn't fit in my phone. Um, I know Moore's, Moore's law, and I hope we still can get it to the next gen generation where there's a big question mark. How do you think you can cope with that massive amount of growth in data uh, while Moore's law is not that, that, that quick. Are you on the right, right track? Can you deal with the, the underlying hardware in that sense and the storage? Oh, oh we'll see, underlying hardware architecture that facilitates that kind of infrastructure? Exactly, well, exactly. Yeah, so actually this, the answer to that is quite simple. Uh, as I said, we had a massive machine that we played for the game of Jeopardy. That was a highly over-provisioned machine. Uh, the reality is that you know, we have, through engineering, refinement, efficiencies, taking advantage of Moore's Law, of course. Um, all through that, of course, you know, one of the reasons why we're cloud-based is that we get to put all that infrastructure dependency behind the wall of the internet. Um, the fact is that, that our computational space is much more compact than what you experience in the case of Jeopardy. But it, actually, the more significant part of the answer is really goes back to the question you asked, which is that it's not that we're taking all of that 44 zettabytes of data, or two and a half exabytes of data today, and merging that into a single computational platform. What we're actually doing is going in and finding those slices of that information that for any given institution or any given deployment is focusing on, you know, that, that's important to, to focus on, right? And of course, you know, different people have different perspectives, and so in aggregate, you know, you should expect that some significant portion of that two and a half exabytes is actually going to be consumed at some point, but it's not in a single machine. It's actually distributed over many different instances um, and only for the, what's relevant to that particular domain. You have to curate the data. You have to get rid of the stuff that's junk. So two and a half exabytes doesn't mean two and a half exabytes of clean data. It's two and a half exabytes of raw data. Some portion of that is relevant. You're going to curate that. You're going to distill that. And then you're going to fill it in with what's not actually captured there. Okay. Okay, we have a question here. Please stand up. Uh, <coughs> um, I am a founder of a startup, so perhaps you might see this as a plug, but how do you see your organizations evolving to the data analytics challenge, particularly in the form of your people that you already have? So do you see new people that are foreign to your organization at the moment taking the charge and running with the problem? Or do you see a way of equipping your existing people to deal with the data analytics challenge that everybody faces? Uh, uh, go ahead, Mike. No, very good question. Uh, with our analysis of looking at this space and the big data, these advanced predictive analytics and the complexities in that, we recognize that uh, we need to partner with uh, appropriate experts there, especially uh, to really understand how we can really capture the value from all our unstructured data that we currently have there, marrying with our, our structured data there. So we have expertise within our organization that we would, we would work with a, a trusted partner or partners uh, from many different areas that, depending on the different use cases that we are looking to explore here. So I think this is the type of, of realm where we really need to work with partners uh, that have uh, specific expertise because these are very advanced areas there we want to learn from those partners and then hopefully uh, bring that expertise in and then continue to do more and then see what uh, what the future holds Go ahead. Uh, I'll have a question that maybe relates to the last two questions asked how many of you in your organizations know if, if there is yet a chief data officer that's been appointed how many of you any of you I see one or two hands uh, there's now been formed just within this last year an international society of chief data officers. There's about three or four hundred of them so far. The reason I'm, I'm saying that, of course, is I think besides the technical issues of being able to store and gather all this mass mass data, there's a huge issue with being able to manage this whole process. 
Uh, in my limited dealings with the medical world, which I'm sure Rob has much more experience with, one of the biggest problems they have is first things like getting permission to access the data. I mean, there's a whole host of issues there. The different standards that different hospitals and groups do, the whole processes of standardization. There's enormous number of challenges, even more challenging than Moore's Law, that we have to overcome. Good news is there is progress being made and the idea of organizations creating chief data officers with responsibilities for trying to address these challenges is a step in that direction. But there are enormous challenges we have, hopefully will be overcome. Actually, data scientists is probably the hardest job out there right now. <laughs> so, uh, any other questions out there? Ah, oh, okay, go ahead. Please stand and identify yourself. Good morning. My name is Martin Hiscox. I'm from AA Investors. Already today, when I uh, pick up my iPhone, um, I've already abdicated an enormous amount of my intelligence to it. Um, it looks after my diary. It answers nearly all the questions I have. It keeps my memory. Well, it actually allows me to enhance my memory. So as you get to the stage where you get cognitive computing that actually will answer many more questions for us, do you think this is going to be deteriorating? Yeah. I mean, it's, there's, it's a philosophical question. I can't be certain of this, but if you look at history, what has happened in the application of any technologies, whether those are cognitive technologies or, or physical technologies, is, is we, we've been able to use them to amplify our own strength, and then we've used the offloading of that strength to go do other things, to pursue other things. Uh, you know, you can draw analogies to our children using calculators in school. Um, you know, my, I, when I learned my kids were allowed to use a calculator in their tasks at school, I was a little bit flippant about it. Uh, a little chagrin that that you know that that they were no longer learning how to do multiplication and addition on their own in their own head, and that they were going to lose something. But the fact is that you know my observation is that those kids, mine, but all their peers as well, ended up actually developing other cognitive capabilities. You know, by not spending their time worrying about that, they ended up spending their time thinking about other things. Now we could argue about how productive that is. You know, the fact that my Sons at, at level 34 of his video game. I'm not sure what that means cognitively, but clearly there's an example there of him being able to do something that I couldn't do, and I suspect a lot of that's because he's offloaded stuff that he wasn't doing before. Anyway, there's lots of debate about that. I'm not sure I'm qualified to, to really um, get into that too deeply, but I, I don't, I'm not particularly worried about us losing our, our intellectual spirit. Uh, I have a tremendous amount of faith in the human um, nature. Um, we are sort of programmed to go pursue intellectual um, challenges, to go you know, occupy our mind, to go do fun and interesting things, and I don't think that goes away. So, so please raise your hands if you have a question. We could bring Mike to, uh, to you. In the meantime, I do have a question now. Um, I'm wondering if you could actually talk about if uh, there is a, some new piece of data or, or a, a, that, that you wish you had about your plant, or maybe you have a problem, you wish there was a solution to it, <laughs> or, or something you really would like, you wish there was a solution, or there was a piece of data that perhaps you wish you could have about your organization or your plant or about your machine. <laughs> who, who would like to start? Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, so uh, this also gets kind of into that big data space there. So areas that probably interest us are what's kind of outside our, our organization there when you look at market intelligence, customer intelligence, all that information there. There's a lot of interesting information that's out there on the internet, the web, social networks and that, that we need to mine in a more efficient and effective way there. So that's probably the one major one that I would look at. Go ahead, Karen. Um, Don Bartusiak mentioned this yesterday in his remarks, but when we look at, at for uh, our business in manufacturing, what our continued challenge is, is unplanned capacity loss. And um, we, we have get lots of data, we analyze it on, on uh, equipment type failures and the types of failures, our work processes we focus on, and then we also focus on the, on the human side of it. So, so we have data that we capture on that in individually, certainly on the equipment. Where we're challenged is the lack of, of um, clarity on the, the human 
aspect of it, the people aspect of it. And being able to, to marry the work process, the equipment data, and the, uh, have the data on the, on the human factors, and look at that holistically uh, and evaluate it would be a, a, a really great opportunity. Um, yeah, I would add uh, to kind of, kind of just reinforce maybe both of these points. There's really two areas, I think, in our company that we're pretty focused on in terms of getting better uh, data uh, in order to be able to prove. One is on this OEE side. So, you know, we're, we're a discrete manufacturer and there's still an inordinate amount of unplanned uh, downtime in our machines. And it's sort of um, beyond just the basic, uh, you know, is the machine running or available or materials available? It's actually tying that into the quality um, uh, control that we have. So, you know, are we making good parts um, is, is an important part of that. And then the second thing I would say, it's a little bit of a bigger one, um, is on this volatility that we see in our end markets. So, you know, um, we're, we talk about 2015 actually as one of the craziest years, uh, nothing that we thought was gonna happen actually happened and, and luckily a few other things happened in our end markets that, that helped us out. But you, know, you think about how that demand ripples through our operations um, was, was really a challenging thing. And so really trying to find a better way of predicting um, and seeing what's ahead of us uh, with regard to our customers is really an important piece. And then again, being able to ripple that through our supply chain. Do we have a question out there? Ah, okay, go ahead, sir. Hi, this is. Uh, so start Jordan. talking, you're welcome. Okay, so um, Adam Fridstrom with Dow Chemical, and I was curious about, we have a large amount of you know, research type documentation and information that is uh, restricted access to, to only, you know, certain people are allowed to, to look, but it, it varies, you know, depending on the business unit that the, the data is. Is it possible to, you know, provide that large base of information but still restrict access to based on the user? It sounds like a challenging thing. Is that something that's possible? So this is an interesting problem. We, we actually ran into this on a couple of occasions where the information um, is stratified and access to the information is compartmentalized in the way that you've described. And uh, there is a dilemma in that, in that for the cognitive system to perform well, it needs to have an understanding of the context in which any particular question and answer may be posed. But the more that it knows, the better it can do it at determining whether what it's answering is correct. So the technique that we've evolved for that situation, which I'm not convinced is entirely perfect, but it's the best that we understand right now, is to in fact expose to the information system, the cognitive system, all the information irrespective of that information stratification, access stratification, allow it to take a question and attempt to understand that question in the context of the entirety of that, that information base, and then selectively respond back to the user based on whether the information, the answers that produced um, are coming from sources that were otherwise restricted. And the restriction, the because the, the filtering that we do is actually not to answer the question, but to change the fidelity or the amount of detail that we might provide in that, that answer, um, again, commensurate to whether the information is coming from a source that that person has access to or not. So, um, you know, the problem is that if we only allow the system to operate on that subset of the information that that individual had access to, then it actually could give that person the wrong, a, a, an answer that would lead them in completely the wrong direction, whereas that's a little different than simply preventing them from getting access to the underlying details that are most um, of, of, of greatest concern. But it's, it's not, it's, it's an area that really needs a lot more study and a lot more um, evolution. Yeah, I, so I could probably uh, answer um, kind of our experience more, more directly. So this is exactly uh, when I was talking about bring your own analytics is something where we're starting is uh, in our engineering and technology and our product design teams, uh, which are, are spread out all over the world. We have uh, 
you know, if you, t if you take a look at our commercial HVAC, we have three main laboratories, and our engineers um, start with physics-based models individually. Uh, we have a common set of modeling tools that we use, but they'll develop models themselves. Uh, usually they'll order tests in any one of those labs, which are independently done, so we might be testing the same uh, basic uh, idea or, or, or validating a model in two places simultaneously, but because we've traditionally restricted access to that information, the two engineers wouldn't know that they were working on the same thing. Um, we'll ultimately build that product and we'll put it into our manufacturing operation and our manufacturing operation will test it in line as we're building it, um, more as a, a, a validation testing, but if you think about that data, there's no reason you wouldn't be able to use that to validate the models, but that's sort of in a separate place and that's three different factories, so that's three separate factories. And so by the time that you look at that one scenario, we probably have 10 or 11 silos of information that if we could federate that uh, and let engineers uh, think about their own analytics on that data, uh, we would get a lot faster and we would get a lot better in terms of uh, our design cycles. And so we're working on that exact issue right now and there is a set of technologies in the security area that allow you to manage uh, access down to the individual and actually revoke those credentials if uh, if you find out that people are treating the data improperly. But it's a, it's a great question and one that I think, uh, you know, is always a balance between access <coughs> and, and security. And so we're, you know, that, that's something where more needs to be done. Well, uh, this kind of relates to the last two questions. One of the views we have regarding big data is a, it's like a microscope. It allows you to see things that have always been going on but we never had a way to see before. And I think, uh, so it's kind of a different use, if you will, of, of kind of the cognitive computing. Uh, some of my colleagues refer to it as collective intelligence. And one of the examples that they uh, demonstrated in one of the projects was being able to predict housing price movements by looking at Google search data. Because by looking at what people are looking at, you can kind of infer what may be on their minds and therefore what their future actions might be. So there's a, there's a tremendous amount of value yet to be fully understood and fully harnessed in this massive amount of data that we're collecting. And it can be used for a vast variety of purposes. Those who mentioned about being able to predict the marketing trends and the demand needs and so on. Uh, there's a lot of that that probably does exist. We just never understood in the past how to be able to harness it. I think we have a question over there. Yes, Ed Podozak from IQMS Manufacturing ERP. One of the panelists mentioned describing what we say we do and what we actually do. And maybe it's for Rob, but also for the other panelists. Out of millions of pieces of text and information, it's very likely that people who'd be considered almost subject matter experts could be at polar opposites on the facts. You know, it's, it's this is the cause, that's the symptom. And we've all seen it. We're, we're you know, good people with good intentions totally disagree. How do you reconcile that in a cognitive learning model as data sources? So, uh, yeah, this is the interesting dynamic of these cognitive systems is that they actually learn their behavior from experts. And, you know, it's important to understand that there are very few universal truths in the world. So we base it on what we call ground truth, which is the accepted truth of that set of experts that they want that system to learn from. Um, so in some sense, it is putting it back on you to decide who you want to bring to the table as your experts, what grand truth you want the system to learn from. And by learning here, what I mean is interpreting meaning because the knowledge base is a separate discussion that has to do with, with uh, curation. But, but it is, you know, I had a very similar question asked to me by a reporter one time, you know, about the whole autonomous driving experience and these sort of moral dilemmas about does the car, you know, drive through the crowd or does the car jump off the cliff and kill the driver? You know, how do you make a decision? Well, the answer to that is that it's going to do what it's taught to do, right? And it's going to learn from experience. It's going to learn from our experience. It's going to learn by observing the way we as humans behave and from that, adapting that in its understanding and its ability to reason. Um, so it's in your hands 
that may be a good thing or may not be a good thing, but the fact is it's still under your control. Get the car stop, yeah. So, yeah, that's it, yeah. So the, the autonomous car would never get itself into a situation where it had to make that moral decision. <laughs> I think we have a question here. Hi, I'm Michael Coden from Next9. We're a cloud-based cybersecurity uh, software company. And I have two questions. One is, um, I don't think we're gonna see Watson in every industrial plant. So it's a cloud solution. It's a cloud solution. And how, if, if we're going to use that to uh, improve our, uh, optimize our plants or whatever, how can we protect the mm -hmm. data that's transferred to Watson? And the other is, uh, what have you looked at the application of cognitive learning to uh, cybersecurity incident detection? And what's the, the potential benefit, uh, significant benefit, I think, to doing that? So on the first question, um, every instance of Watson is isolated from every other instance. So when we contract with an institution over their needs for cognitive computing, they get their own unique, distinct instance and completely isolated from every instance. And the data that you bring to the table is entirely yours and remains separate from anybody else's data, um, including the training models, including all the things that you, that you teach it. So that, that, is, that is respected and preserved. Um, actually, Stuart, I know you've got some background in in cybersecurity, do you want to speak a little bit to the application of cognitive computing to that? Um, well, well, for those who didn't hear the question, I think it's a fascinating question. One of the biggest challenges in the, the cybersecurity world, uh, I think most rational people now, most, realize that the odds are someone either is in or will get into your systems. You know, if they've broken the NSA, they broke into the Office of Personnel Management, probably they've broken in, maybe they've broken into Watson, probably know. The biggest challenges I think we have now is to know it has happened. And so one of the things that people are struggling with, and this may be a great use for cognitive computing, is how do you detect that there is activity going on in your computer systems different than what you desire? Now, don't get me wrong, uh, there are lots of products out there that do it. The problem is the false positives. According to at least one report, when Target was being broken into and credit cards were being stolen, 30,000 alerts had taken place that day. The problem is that to go through 30,000 alerts to realize that something really was going on overwhelmed the humans. So the question is, can we find a way to detect really fine-grained changes in patents that are indicative of a cyber attack going on? And I don't know if Watch can do that or not, but that sounds like a fascinating challenge. I think it, it is exactly what you said, and it does lend itself very much to the principles that we apply to cognitive systems, which is essentially to sense as many different fine-grained signals as we can and use machine learning to kind of separate the noise from the signal. Uh, that is what a cognitive system is doing, doing the extremely large, in, in extremely large dimensions is um, the real technical feat. And uh, so I think in that sense, if you can think about the security problem in terms of all the things that represent behavioral signals and interpret the behavioral anomalies uh, as patterns, then I, it, in principle it should apply, right? And no, we haven't done it. It just occurred to me maybe a, a, some of a broader version of this and maybe something for you to think about. In your plans, how do you recognize that something is not operating in the right way? So it doesn't have to be a cyber attack. But, but someone kind of watching over your, God, if you will, looking over your plan saying, something is going wrong over there. So th there's some fascinating capabilities if we can finally learn a way to understand irre uh, undesirable behavior going on that may be very subtle. Um, uh, I, I have a question. Um, I want to extend this obviously called native computing. We talked a little bit about smart machines. You know, how smart machines obviously get better you know, every day they operate. I'm wondering if uh, Carol, Paul, Mike, are you exploring, bringing some of these smart machines uh, uh, into your organizations? Uh, or where are you uh, uh, in regards to that? Or when do you think you, you would be ready to start bringing some of these smart machines into your organizations? Uh, Carol, would you like to maybe start? 
Well, sure, it would be really interesting. I mean, for us, um, you know, even on the big data we were talking about earlier, it's, all, it's always about the value proposition, right, and the justification for it. So, um, and, and we go through those processes on a regular basis when we're evaluating applied technology um, or even our big data. Uh, and in, in fact, on that big data, which is part of really related to smart machines too, is the more data you have in managing it. We looked at that a number of years ago in trying to find the right business use cases and the technology wasn't there. Now that obviously the technology is here uh, and that's the real challenge we have is finding what's the right data. Yes, there's lots of data out there. How do we best utilize it and, uh, and have that right value proposition for our, for our businesses? So, so absolutely we would be interested um, for the right uh, for the right justifications. So, um, again, I think there's, uh, uh, there's a couple, of, couple of directions for us. So first of all, in our company, we make a lot of stuff. So every uh, product line that we have, I think, is to one extent or another wrestling with uh, the level of smartness that they're going to have in their product. We haven't shipped a golf or utility. Paul, oh, oh, I'll take that microphone's on. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, no, thank you. Um, so every one of our product lines is wrestling uh, to one extent or another with how smart these things need to be. And, uh, you know, I, I, I enjoy it, but, uh, you know, the golf car and utility car uh, market that we're in, we haven't shipped a car that wasn't instrumented and connectable um, in a couple of years now. Um, not, not much of that is actually um, helping the customer directly. Uh, we do have some applications that uh, that do help in that direction, but we gather all the warranty information right now and actually proactively dispatch service on those machines. Um, and so we, we, I could talk to a number of different examples of that, but everything that we do, our turbo machinery, our large chillers, and we're working right now on rooftop air conditionings, even, even air conditioning for your home is connected to dealer diagnostics uh, earlier this year. Um, we do. We also use quite a bit of smart machines in our in our factories. I was uh, in a presentation yesterday from Mazak. We're we're um, you know helping on this OEE uh, conversation that we brought up before. Big focus of ours, and we want to partner with our machine tool vendors. Um, you know, I, I think I would just say one of the concerns that we have, um, both as a provider and a user of smart machines is sort of the model that we're talking about, that every machine is going to be connected to the, to the cloud and, and then the cloud is going to do something and come back into our factory. Um, we're a little bit more focused on trying to figure out how that, those smart machines can collaborate inside of our factories. So how do we take a, you know, a milling machine, a grinder, and our metrology or coordinated measurement machines and connect them into a, a more smart system uh, in order to be able to get better uh, outcomes from the parts that we're trying to make uh, in our factories. And so, I, I'm, I'm, you know, we didn't talk about it too much on the panel so far, but um, you know, I think smart machines are not so much a concept today as a reality, and that everybody needs to be having a strategy for 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 that. Yeah. Mike, right. I'll just add one point that uh, sort of supplement uh, what uh, Carolyn Paul said was that uh, an area that we've really explored on the smart side has been smart cameras uh, with uh, very advanced uh, camera technology out in the field, processing at the camera level, sending information to an operator has been very valuable. We've utilized it, some very nice uh, systems out in many different applications and really has provided some very uh, interesting analytics to the operation uh, going forward there for, so we've used those in many different aspects there and we tend to propagate it right across the organization. So one particular area, as we're obviously we're renewing uh, different uh, assets there, we're picking up new smarter uh, machinery in that and we'll be utilizing them accordingly. Uh, go ahead. Well, just real quickly, uh, we're also collaborating with the Valley Mining Company in Brazil. Uh, we had one of the researchers who they were working with us this past year and they're very deeply involved in the issue of automated mining uh, for both operational reasons, because these things tend to be in, in unpleasant places to have people at, uh, but also just to be able to run, run them 24 hours a day. And the idea of autonomous vehicles, uh, some of which are basically the size of this room, being controlled by someone thousands of miles away. Uh, you no, know, so it is happening now. Once again, obviously these are, these are early experiments and early tests, but, but the idea of, of smart machines 
all around us, not just in our factories, is, is becoming part of the reality. Excellent. Um, great discussion. And I really want to thank you all for listening. And please join me in uh, giving our panelists a big hand. <laughs>